Hey, I'm I sorry. Said hi to there. I had to invite you. Maybe, maybe I was having a boomer moment. I'm so sorry. I'm so sick. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this. I'm sorry, guys. I am really sick this week. I've been sick since Monday. I probably have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I'm very unwell so I'm still here though um I am very unwell I'm not well <laughs> mentally I'm, I am not well mentally physically spiritually <laughs> thanks Bob oh, it's been a very long week for me um I, you know, and I will say we're late because of me, because I am not well. <laughs> you guys can 100% blame me. Um, I think it's funny that you think, like, they care. Like, not that I'm, we're late. Like, obviously, you guys care that we're late. But, like, <laughs> they don't care that it's your fault, <laughs> Elle. Like, I know. we as a collective have let them down. <laughs> I just feel like this week it was me, and I'm just, oh, gosh. I feel horrible, but, you yeah. know, L is what is going through what we in the biz refer to as Pisces season, and she's just very emotional. <laughs> right now. I'm not emotional. I just, I want to crawl into my bed yeah. and go to sleep. Yeah. yeah, this is my perpetual state of being, so, you know. Welcome uh, to the party, Belle. Oh, Craig cares that it's my fault. Of course he does. Because later on when I'm feeling better and he doesn't feel bad for insulting me, he can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. I'm also a little dehydrated. So I think that's also adding to why I'm not <laughs> feeling the best. But it's okay. Well, we have my There's a list of all my life problems. I have a lot of problems. <laughs> there, there. There, there. What's your mug say this week? I don't oh, know. It's like, put on a kilt and call me stuff. Oh, it's the Outlander one. <laughs> Please do, anyone. I'm here um, for I don't, know. I don't have a mug yet, so I'm just going to take this off the shelf and, you know, pretend like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Did you see how, like, <laughs> styrofoam flew off of it? Okay, I that down like, now. because I am going to go downhill so fast. I think we should get going. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Got you. Let's go. <laughs> okay, everyone. Welcome back to So You Wanna, a show for writers by writers. We started the show to give authors a place to chat, hang out, and just generally be. The world needs more books. It needs your books. Let's make that happen. I'm Elle. Uh, and like I said, I'm sick and I'm tired, but hey, I got a new puppy this week, so life is good. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the author of the Contemporary Romances for the Love of Art, which was shortlisted for the 2021 Wadis, Read, which is the first book in my Bachelor Collective series, A Very Color Glenn Christmas, and my brand new just released One Last Night, which is currently updating daily. All of this is over on Wattpad. Just follow the links in my bio and you can check out all my work. And finally, a reminder, I'm on TikTok. I have been sick and I do have a new puppy, so I have not been posting reels and TikToks as much just because I'm getting kind of into the routine with my new dog, but uh, I do have them. They're funny. They're, you know, silly. <laughs> so uh, just head on over there. Check it out at lmeredith.writes. Dog barking. Uh, he's a little bit whiny, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a puppy sitter, so it's all good. <laughs> I don't have a new puppy, so yeah. <laughs> I will bring him on the show one day. He's just a little bit, uh, right now he's a lot. So. <laughs> I know. That's like the best time, though. Yeah, I know. He's very cute. You guys, if you go on my profile, I, I do share pictures of him, and I do have a video about how you know, the more boys I meet, the more I love my dog, which is true. Okay, here we go on, Nick. <laughs> There's a lot there. All right. <laughs> well, I'm Meg. I am the author of the Miranda Rights Trilogy, the Ostler's Boy series, uh, the Holiday Affair, 
<sighs> what else do I have? Birds and bullets. <laughs> and uh, a new project that I'm working on now. All of my the work. The Pisces is season project. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you're a member cool. of our Discord, which by the way, we have a Discord, um, you will see that over in the Swan Pond, which is where I keep all my stuff. Because um, I don't think anyone knows as I like swans. Anyway, um, I've announced a super secret Pisces seasons project that I am working on. Um, if it's not obvious by now, I am a Pisces, so I'm celebrating. But yeah, uh, if you want to read any of that garbage, I'm just kidding. It's over on Wattpad <laughs> at Megan Alexandria. Or you can follow me here on Instagram. I'm the author Megan Alexandria one. So we have a podcast. It is going well. It's releasing on Tuesdays. At I recorded six. sick yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> 6 a.m. <laughs> Eastern every week. <laughs> Um, what was the last one we had out was fantasy? Yeah, there was fantasy. So this mm -hmm. week, the one that's coming out is world building is what's coming on Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. So, so far we have romance. We went back and revisited our how to build a romance episode there and we break it down for you again. Um, this time in podcast form. So you don't have to look at our faces. The next one is character building. Then we had fantasy and we had Matthew Romeo back on for that. We did world building, which is coming out. So fantasy one is great, you guys. We talk in depth about the Sorting Hat, and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a good time. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're also working on a wor uh, website. We do have merch. It's live now. You can find us on Teespring.com. There's a link in my bio. If that doesn't suit your fancy and maybe you just want to search it, you can go to Teespring.com and type in So You Wanna. We will come right up. The only piece of merch I have in my possession is this pillow. I ordered a mug as well, but it came shattered. So that is on its way back to me. Sorry. And I'm just uh, saying, everyone probably wants to cuddle with our faces, so. I know I do. I take this and I get my So You Want a Blanket that you made me, and I just wrap myself up in it, and I just sing, Elle loves me, yes she does. <laughs> it's a good time. Definitely uh, not a red flag. Yeah, um, makes me nervous because... <laughs> Uh, just let everyone know, we do have official when Elle and Meg will meet and have a live date. Um, so I feel like we'll announce that now because everyone asked. Yes, uh, we will be officially meeting. And yes, we are going to do a live together. It won't be like this style because we... Why would we do that? Yeah. Yeah, that would be weird. Stay <laughs> <laughs> true. But yes, I am going down to the States. <laughs> <laughs> leaving my beautiful Canada <laughs> in August. Um, I cannot remember the exact dates. I think it's like the 24th-ish of August uh, for a week in there. So anyway. Yeah. It's that is there. When you said August, I panicked. And I said, I thought we were doing September. But then I realized that we changed it from September to August. So I don't even know yeah. what's here. Yeah. You're going to show up and be like, <laughs> Hey, no one picked me up at the airport, and I'll be like, "Oh <laughs> shit, it was that was today." Um, yeah, no, yeah, that's that is happening. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Chat is My saying, brain is like just going down. Oh, I can feel it, and Bob is chanting "USA." USA, yeah. I'm feeling a little bit insulted because I'm still Canadian, you guys. I still love Canada. Um, mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not bad to be Canadian. Yeah, it's also not my first trip to the States, just so that everyone's aware. <laughs> yeah, States. she's not going to have like, a total <laughs> culture not, shock when she gets down here. And yeah, it's not like I Everyone's know. got their, uh, you know, Yosemite Sam pistol strap to their hips. <laughs> Ready to go. In Canada, I'm only licensed for long guns, so I do not know what that's like. I can strap a long gun to my back. You, walk so you can do that here, too. It's, it's about the country. <laughs> the point is, that is not what tonight's show is about. 
<laughs> it's not tonight, you guys. We're going to talk about the history of Black authors. It is still February, so we want to keep that vibe going of how mm -hmm. to diversify our reads. And I think something that's so important is actually talking about the history of where everyone started and how we got to today, because there's still so much work that needs to be done in the writing industry to support Black authors, and all of us can play a role in helping make that happen. I think you said yesterday when we were recording the show that comes after World Building, I will leave that as a surprise, um, you said that uh, a line that really like stuck with me and it was that the education never stops. And I think that that's very important, especially when you apply it to things like Black History Month, you know, you should always seek to expand your knowledge and challenge the knowledge that you've you have as it is or you've been pre prevent, uh, presented presented is the word thank you kindly and you know just continue to be the best so and I will say that like you know I'm obviously a black author myself but I still mm -hmm. seek to educate myself because there's a lot of things that I don't know like you know I mean we're just talking about how I'm going to the states obviously I'm not from there obviously my education of what you know, black history is, is very Canadianized. And mm -hmm. so I still need to learn a lot more about what it's like down there, especially if I'm going to write about down there and stuff yeah. like that. Right. So, you know, it doesn't matter what, like who you are, you're always going to keep educating yourself and teaching yeah. yourself new things. And on February 6th, I also talked about the fact that, fact that I don't have black hair, you know, I got mm -hmm. my dad's hair, which was, you know, very straight, and very, you know, Caucasian. And so, you know, like there's nothing wrong with me writing someone who does have black hair but I do need to mm -hmm. educate myself on it because I don't have to do all the same things that someone who has black hair does so mm -hmm. you're always educating yourself doesn't matter who you are <laughs> yeah so. all right all right well, let's dive in <laughs> <laughs> um yeah okay so obviously I'm going to be talking about African American literature just because most of our viewership tends to be from America and a lot of people tend to write stories based in the U.S. so it just kind of made sense to stick to that area. Um, of course I do highly recommend that you research everywhere and you learn about all different places and especially if you're going to write about a different place. Uh, we just like there's so much we can never cover it in an hour like the full history of everything. Um, so we're just kind of condensing um, what our viewers seem to ask the most questions about and the place that we get asked about the most is mm -hmm. always the United States. So that's where we're going. USA! Uh, that's enough of that chance. I know! <laughs> Sorry, Canada! Canada! Woo! Canada! Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So African American history predates um, the United States even being an independent country. So you have to think that the literature has similarly deep roots. So we're going to start with Lucy Terry as the oldest known um, piece of African American literature, which is Barr's Fight. Um, that, sorry, Lucy Terry is the author. I'm sorry, guys. Just so you know, I'm sick. I'm going to do my best here, but things are going yeah. Everyone believes that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not just me as a person. Um, anyway... So Terry wrote the ballad in 1746 after a Native American attack on Deerfield. I can never say the state. No one make fun of me. Massachusetts. That was right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so anyway, she was enslaved in Deerfield at the time of the attack when many residents were killed and more than 100, mostly women and children, were taken on a forced march over land to Montreal, which Montreal is in Canada for anyone who... Uh, doesn't know all these cities and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Massachusetts so, um, is a state in the United States. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's Midwest, mostly because the Midwest still confuses me. But <laughs> <laughs> we won't get into that. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so some were later ransomed and redeemed by their families or community. Others were adopted by Mohawk families, um, and other girls joined uh, French religious orders. So the ballad was first published in 1854 with an additional couplet in the Springfield Republican in 1855. Mm -hmm. And then another early African-American author was Jupiter Hammond. Um, and he was a domestic slave in Queens, New York. Uh, Hammond considered, was considered the first published Black writer in America. 
Um, and he published his poem, An Evening Thought, Salvation by Christ. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then we have William Wells Brown uh, and Victor, I'm going to mess up this last name, you guys. I'm sorry. I'm bad with names. Sejour, uh, who produced the earliest works of fiction by African-American writers. Um, Sejour was born free in New Orleans. Um, so he was a free person of color. So for anyone who doesn't know, that means that he was not enslaved. Um, and he moved to France around the age of 19, and that's where he published his short story, The Mulatto, in 1837. Mm -hmm. And it is the first known work of fiction by an African-American, um, but that was also written in French. <clears throat> Brown, who was the other one that I mentioned, William Brown, on mm -hmm. the other hand, was a prominent abolish lecturer, novelist, playwright, and historian. historian. Uh, he was born into slavery in Kentucky, so kind of the opposite of, uh, mm -hmm. of Seashore. Yeah. Um, and he was working on riverboats based in St. Louis, Missouri, when he escaped to Ohio. Um, and that's when he began to work for abolitionist causes and made his way to Buffalo, New York, <laughs> and later to Boston. I have to say this state again, and I'm terrible at it, Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. Still right. And so he was a prolif prolific writer, beginning with an account of his escape to freedom and his experience under slavery, mm -hmm. which you'll find in African literature. That's where a lot of it started. It was a lot of personal stories of escape from slavery, life in slavery, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the first novel published in the United States by an African-American woman was Harriet Wilson's Our Nig, which was published in 1859. Um, and express the difficulties of lives of Northern free Blacks. So again, for anyone who does not know, I um, hope I get this right. Like I said, my history may not be good. Meg, you can correct me. Uh, the North was where slaves went. Uh, sorry, I had a text come in. Uh, <laughs> North is where slaves went to be free and the South was where the slave. Okay, yeah, so I do have that yep. right. Yeah, that's right. So, so she was talking about the difficulty of living in the North as a free Black. Mm -hmm. And our NIG was actually rediscovered and republished by Henry Louis Gates in the early 1980s. Um, he labeled the work um, as fiction. It was actually originally uh, labeled as nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So over the years, that book has been, there's been a lot of back and forth between is this fiction, is this nonfiction mm -hmm. kind of thing. Ultimately, it's been deemed as a work of fiction, which made her the first published um, African-American woman. So as time went on, um, a genre of African-American literature that was developed in the middle of the 19th century is the slave narrative, um, which are accounts uh, written by slaves about their lives in the South and often after escaping to freedom, as I kind of talked about. Um, a lot of them talked about the cruelties of life under slavery, as well as the persistent humanity of the slaves as people. Um, and at the time, the controversy over slavery led to impassioned literature on both sides of the fence, um, with novels such as Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher um, representing the abolition. I'm so bad at saying this word, abolitionist <laughs> view of the evils of slavery. Slavery. Oh my gosh. Okay, so after the end of slavery um, and the American Civil War, a number of African-American authors wrote non-fiction works about the condition of African-Americans in the United States. Mm -hmm. Many African-American women wrote about the principles of behavior of life during the period. African-American newspapers were a popular venue for essays, poetry, and fiction, as well as journalism. The Harlem, the Harlem <laughs> Renaissance from 1920 to 1940 was um, a flowering of the African-American literature and art based in the African-American community of Harlem, which is in New York City. Mm -hmm. It was part of a larger social thought and culture. So no, numerous Black artists, musicians, and other produced classic works. Um, and this went all the way from jazz to theater. So this is when we started to see more of African-American culture coming out in the States. Mm -hmm. A large migration of African-Americans began during World War I, hitting its high point during World War II. So during this great migration, Black people left the racism and lack of opportunities 
in the American South, and they started to settle more in the northern cities, such as Chicago, um, where they began working in factories and other sectors of the economy. So with the migration, it produced a new sense of independence in the Black community and contributed to the vibrant Black urban culture um, that was seen during the Harlem Renaissance. So the migration also empowered the growing civil rights movement, which made a powerful impression on Black writers during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Just as Black activists were pushing to end segregation and racism and create a new sense of Black nationalism, so too were Black authors attempting to address these issues in their writing. Mm -hmm. So yes, as you guys can see, there were problems even as, or, or as not so far back as the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> um, which uh, anyone who's like mine and Meg's age, that, like, our parents were alive during this time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so beginning in the 1970s, African-American literature reached the mainstream as books by Black writers continually achieved best-selling and award-winning status. Mm -hmm. um, this was also a time when the work of African-American writers began to be accepted by academia as a legitimate genre mm -hmm. of American literature. And yes, I did say 1970s. <laughs> so it really was not that long ago. Um, and as a part, the larger Black arts movement, which was inspired by civil rights um, and Black power movements, of African-American literature began to be defined and analyzed. So a number of scholars and writers are generally credited with helping promote and define African-American literature as a genre. Mm -hmm. um, and this time period, including fiction writers such as Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and poet James Emanuel, which might be names that you guys actually know more than the <laughs> older <laughs> ones. Um, you know, James Emanuel took a major step towards defining African-American literature when he edited a uh, dark symphony Negro Literature in America, which was a collection of Black writings, which was actually finally released by a major publisher. So these were like mm -hmm. old writings that finally saw the light of day from a real publisher. Yeah. So the 1970s also saw African American books by and about African American life that was actually topping bestseller lists. But regardless of the gains that were in Black literature from, you know, before civil rights all the way up till now, um, in the United States, um, including in, um, in the industry, the publishing and translation industry, has always continued to actually be predominantly white. So we do have a lot of influential figures, such as Oprah Winfrey, um, who have been using their leverage to promote more of this literature and give Black authors a much farther reach than they otherwise would have had. But we still see a lot of issues with Black authors not getting the same opportunities as their white counterparts. So, you know, there's lots of things that in modern times have helped. So obviously the invention of the internet has been great because now Black authors have a lot more ability to put their books out there through websites like Wattpad, which we always talk about because we're on, and also mm -hmm. self-publishing and stuff like that. Um, but of course, we want to create a world where, you know, whether it's a Black author, a white author, an Asian author, whoever is presenting their work to a publishing house, that everyone has equal opportunity to get picked up. Mm -hmm. And so by learning history and understanding how far we've come and how, how you know, actually not that long ago it was that we were finally actually seeing Black authors more in mainstream literature, it's important to remember that we still have a really long way to go to make sure that we are diversifying our reads, diversifying mm -hmm. authors out there, and creating equal opportunities for everyone. So Meg is actually going to talk a little bit more about actually diversifying your writing and diversifying your reads mm -hmm. to help obviously promote more Black authors and to do it not just this month, but all year round. My in true Pisces fashion, guys, I, uh, I'm going to say that like all month. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> my phone is nearly dead. I did not charge it on the way home per usual. So now it is plugged in. You were on the phone on your way home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, when we're like chatting. Okay. 
I should. Yeah, that's the problem. That's what I do. Anytime that is the problem. Like, whenever you call me when I'm driving home from work, I always charge it because Instagram like drains the battery. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah, it sure does. And that's why we're in this predicament and why my phone just told me I had 10%. So it's charging. It's fine. <laughs> All is well. <clears throat> oh, okay. <gasps> So let's talk about actually diversifying your writing and your readership every month of the year. And okay, if you turn tuned into our show on February 6th, so we talked to some really amazing authors who talked to us about diversifying their writing and readership and what that means um, and how to do it effectively and the importance of doing it year round, like Elle said, not just during Black History Month. So surprise, surprise, <laughs> I'm black only in February. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Okay. So <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> um, so as a writer, it can be really daunting to have to tackle it like a culture or even something like a illness or a disability that you don't know anything or a lot about. Um, and we all have the goal of creating relatable and realistic characters. And there is that, that saying that you should write what you know, but that's not necessarily true. No. So we had an author that came on here. Her name is Katrina. She came on um, at Christmas and she had a great quote and that was culture is meant to be shared. Oh, I love so, that quote. Mm -hmm. uh, she also said, don't not do it, do it. <laughs> so <laughs> both of those quotes stuck out because they showed just how important it is to represent everybody. Um, and you don't have to be an expert to do that. You just have to be willing to put in the work to make sure that it's done right. So by doing that, we ask questions to people who know the answer or might know the answer. Um, we network in that. So you reach out to L or me and you say, hey, I'm looking for someone who can tell me about this culture, or this religion, or whatever it is. And we say, hey, I do have someone for that. Stand by. And then we get them and we send it to you. It's quite easy. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, but you know, even if we don't have that, or you know, you don't have that immediate, um, you know, connection there, there are resources out there and other people on the internet who exist besides L and I who want to help you find those answers. Um, and you know, kind of as I, I brought it up earlier, L says that the education never stops the most helpful and like important thing that you can do is educate and spread that education and you know share resources and find resources and just continue to keep that rolling so um another great way of learning is by reading um we say this a lot when we talk about genres but a great starting point in embarking on this is to see who else is doing it and who is doing it right. So, uh, L, I think you have a couple authors that you want to share, yeah. right? Yeah, I was going to share. Um, yeah, I do have a couple. So this is a great book. It is by oh, Black, uh, The Wedding Date. It's a romance and it's actually like, it's, you can see it right on the cover that you're actually dealing with an interracial couple. So, yeah. um, which is really nice, obviously. Um, so, yeah. So this is someone who I think did it really well. She talked about issues in being in an interracial couple, all while keeping it a very great romance. So if you're a romance mm -hmm. reader, you can take in the information and still enjoy the book without feeling like you're reading a, a drama about, you know, about like racism and, and all right, this. Right, yeah. So it was really well done. So I highly recommend it if you are into romances. This is an author who I love, um, Lawrence Hill. I've read all of his books. Everyone will know probably the book of Negroes the best. Um, it was made into um, like a six part series like many years ago. But anyway, that was also really good. Highly recommend watching it. 
Um, wow, Elle has recommended a show that is unheard of. It's a show based on a book that I read for a <laughs> yeah. Does it count? It still counts. Okay. Well, give me, yes, I finally get one for watching TV. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. I rarely do. So. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, he's a really good author. He talks a lot about issues, um, mostly in Canada, um, but he talks about a lot of issues facing black communities and stuff like that and he's written a lot of really good books uh, my favorite one by him is called some great thing and it's mm -hmm. really good uh this one's good too um but yeah anyway this book i'm going to talk about it's not by a black author but it is um about a black people mm -hmm. and their struggles and that's the help so if you are yeah. a white author i just want to say that you can write a great powerful book about the struggles of being black, you know, during like this was based in what, like 1960 something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 1960 in Jackson, Miss yeah. Mississippi. Mississippi. Thank you. You did it. <laughs> I just remember in school us all being like, I can spell Mississippi. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that you do not have to be black to write a great book that, you know, sticks out and, um, you just you have know, to care. And you just have to care about yeah. doing it right. You have to, yeah, you just have to care about doing it right. Exactly. So, you know, don't feel like you are ever stifled by, you know, the color of your skin. If you have a story you want to write, then, you know, write it. Just, be, yeah. you know, do it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, um, you know, that's a good segue to kind of touch on. I know we mentioned this before in our other shows, but, you know, there are sensitivity readers out there. So if you are not sure and you write something, you know, you can always hire someone or find somebody to do that for you where they will read it and they will go through and they will say like, okay, hey, we need to revisit this or this is offensive because of this or hey, it looks good, you know, whatever the case is. Um, I actually employed Elle to do that for me in uh, Of Swords and Horses because the main character in that book is not white. And he's not black because it is a made up world. He's somewhere in Araya. But the point is, you know, there's a difference between skin tones and it becomes a big issue in the book. And I wanted to make sure that I was presenting that correctly, you know, um, and nothing was coming off as horrible. And then I made Elle read all those places, you know, to make sure that, you know, I wasn't making an ass of myself. And that's what it is I, at the end of the day. So. I will say sometimes in writing, depending what you're writing about, what era, what is the culture there and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or even if it's a made up world, what is the culture around yeah. you know, different um, you know, cultures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, yeah, it is going to come out a little offensive. But the whole idea of that is, is that there's meaning behind that. Like, it, you don't do it for shock value that you're doing it. Yeah. It actually please, God, please story. do not do it for shock value. I can't yeah, think of the number of times that Ellen and I have read something that has pieces of it in the story for shock value and it's it does not get the reaction that you want it is not no, it's just it's terrible yeah don't do it for shock value yeah and if you listen to our podcast you'll hear me say probably ten thousand times more than i say do your research uh you know make sure that your characters serve a purpose <laughs> and that <laughs> You know, they they change the plot and who they are, who their identity is, are, you know, matter. So my brain just goes to the number of times you said rule of lamp yesterday. Yes, I was thinking about saying that. So the rule of lamp for anyone <laughs> listening right now, it's a great rule. It's the best rule. If your character, if any character, pick a random person in your book. If I can take that person and pluck them out of your story and replace them with an actual lamp and it does not change the course of events you are doing it wrong and you are doing yourself an injustice and your readership an injustice so don't do that <laughs> make people more than an appliance okay like a lamp's not an appliance i'd call it more a serves a purpose okay <laughs> i feel like as a writer i could 
make that work okay with the thesaurus i feel like i could make that work the point is rule of lamp <laughs> your people are people your characters are people don't don't make them lamps okay, yeah. okay. enough of that <laughs> something else to consider guys uh, when you are supporting black authors and black writers uh year round is to go to places like black owned bookstores um if there's one where you live um just throw that onto the list of the place where you buy books, you know, make it. Or even visit. No. What? Yeah. I said, or even just visit, you know, go inside and see what it's about. You never know what's in there yeah. and what you'll find. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, in the same line of bookstores, there are book boxes. Uh, those are everywhere on Instagram. Um, so you can, you can find black owned book box companies and support them by su subscribing every month. Mm -hmm. um and yeah so of course the most important one that we're gonna talk about on so you wanna not the most important but uh, a <laughs> prominent one we're gonna talk about on so you wanna because this is a community for writers by writers is indie authors Ooh. so you know just make an intention of putting black indie authors onto your to be read list by the by the books and you know whether you're buying on amazon or supporting them on wattpad or sites like it you know it matters it makes a difference so <sighs> too long didn't read when you think about diversity um what does diversity look like you know um what i like to do is i like to think of um rihanna's uh savage x Fenny line i don't know if you've ever been to her instagram or you've been to her website but it's actually incredibly diverse so you have models who are every every skin tone you have models who are every body shape you have models who are missing limbs you have models who are you know not the mainstream photoshopped you know things that we've been presented before and it's just nice it's to that see thin women <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's nice to see real people. And so when you're writing, just remember that your book should emulate life and life in the world is a diverse place. So therefore your works should be as well. Because the uh, end of my soapbox speech, I'm sorry. <laughs> take it down. Okay. <laughs> it's funny when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, it just reminds me of like what um, when you're talking about the models, remind me of what Adrian said about how everyone is not like 120 pounds and like super thin. And I'm like, yeah, it's so true. I mean, so, my driver's license says I am, but let's... I don't know. My driver's license does not say my weight. How's my height? Canada is weird. Well, I also, you have to understand, okay, where I live, literally when I got my driver's license at like 16... All it was was a laminated piece of paper. If I went anywhere in Canada and used it as, like, ID to go into a, a bar or a club, you, they had to, like, pull out a book to actually, like, flip through and make sure that they oh my God. the size oh my God. where <laughs> this was not just a, you know, like, made-up ID because it was, like, we literally just that got the car, like I think, like, when I was, I was back from university, so I, I was, like, 23 or something, when they finally had, like, oh real... <laughs> oh I'll, show you, I'll show you when I'm in Indiana, like, how um, lame they are. <laughs> but just so you know, our driver's licenses here are, are like, intense, okay? They've got, like, the reflective in them. And yeah. Like that. And when you go to, like, a bar, they, like, you know look at you and look at the you know like, like back and like forth actually. back and forth and they like like it's almost like in you know old times where they would take the gold and like bite on it to make sure it's real like so you, you would like, not get away with like a piece of paper that says I can do what I want like what's so crazy though is like so I went to school in Ontario and in Ontario their driver's licenses are like one step down from a passport like security yeah. wise that's how intense they are. And then here I am handing them my not a bad idea. Piece of paper being like, I'm 19, I can drink. Like, <laughs> wink. Hold on, I have to ask: Is the drinking age 18 in 
Alberta and Quebec. Is it 21 everywhere else? 19. But in Canada, you are allowed to, like, where I live, um, you're allowed to, so if you're 14, if your parent says, yeah, they can have a beer, you can order a beer at dinner for your, for your teenager. You just have to be of legal drinking age and be responsible for them. Oh my God. That, okay. Wow. Earlier in this episode, I said that the United States was God's country. That was a filthy lie. It is apparently Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That was a wild ride, guys. I feel, <laughs> I feel like I've learned a lot. <laughs> You're welcome for the education on Canada and our drinking habits. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to say that where I live, we have the highest drinking like rate per capita but it might be here mm -hmm. okay anyway <laughs> no comment <laughs> question the, the I, ages. two things okay. before we get into questions okay one uh if you have any questions right now please drop them into the chat that was a bonus one so really for now the real thing that i was going to say is one <laughs> that's totally related Tricky. if you have authors that you want us to give a shout out to or that are your favorite or you were thinking hey they didn't mention this person drop them in the chat mm -hmm. because then everybody can read it we can read it out loud we can share it it'll be great oh, no. Megan and I read to each other <laughs> yeah um and two I don't remember <laughs> hold on it was important <laughs> I don't remember, but I'm just going to say, if you have any questions about tonight's show, please throw that into the chat. That was quick. That, that, the thoughts just fluttered away. They're gone into the space. It's Pisces season. It's oh. Pisces season. <laughs> Bringing on the questions now. So question one, as a white author, is it okay to write black characters or about black history? Yep. I brought up the help. Um, yeah, she's a white author. It's totally fine. Just to make sure again that you're doing it respectfully, that you're doing your research. Um, you're using your resources. Questions. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and you know, get sensitivity readers. I think that that's really helpful um, mm -hmm. to have. And yeah, like I, I, like Katrina said, don't not do it. Do it. <laughs> do you guys hear my cat? I am so sorry. He is just. Clawing at the door. I sound like a monster, but you guys don't understand if I let him in here He will hop on my lap and his butt will be in the camera. It's just it's not nice. That is butt so cute <laughs> Yeah, you weirdo. That was a weird comment. Okay, question number two As Stay away are, from my cat um, <laughs> Are there things to consider when writing an interracial couple? Yes um, anytime you're writing two different um, cultures together you, there's always a lot to consider and it doesn't matter what culture you're dealing with um mm -hmm. most cultures that are not well not most all cultures that are not white have like they face some form of racism um there's also issues like you know different cultures have different things that they celebrate and that can sometimes be a challenge when it comes to holidays or mm -hmm. um you know i mean holidays is all that comes to mind <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's like holidays and stuff. So these meeting are the family, you know, meeting friends. Yeah. Um, and also, like, I mean, I know for myself specifically, like, whenever it comes to dating and stuff like that, like, I was, I've always been very specific. Like, I don't need, like, my friends and stuff, like, the people in my life, like, if you want to have any kind of relationship with mm -hmm. me, whether it's friendship or more, I need you to not be just not racist. I need you to be anti-racist. Yeah. Like, I need you to be against the systems that prevent me from being able to, you know, achieve all I want to achieve. Be, with, uh, be treated be, like a human being, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> so it's like, so, you know, and these are things that you have to consider when you are writing, you know, mm -hmm. two different races together is, you know, what what racism means to each person because you know like not trying to offend anybody but i found you know in past relationships in my life it's it's been hard to express like how difficult dealing with racism is mm -hmm. and how painful dealing with racism is like even 
watching it, like seeing a Confederate flag just being willy nilly flown all over the place. It's very hard to talk about like how deeply unsettling and how scary that feels to know going on, you know? So these are all things to consider whenever it comes to writing mm -hmm. interracial couples is what does that mean? And what is that dynamic going to look like? And also, you know, the person, like if you're, I'm, I'll use, you know, a white, a white person and a black person, just cause that's what I grew up with and with my mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried that I got the circle of death. Nope, you're still there. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> and realizing they're probably going to say something offensive and not jumping to this person is horrible, but saying, mm -hmm. okay, I have to take a minute and educate, you yeah. know, that person. Because I, like, I found in my life, most people are not meaning to be hurtful to me. It's that they just don't know. And yeah. they just need me to explain to them why it's offensive and why mm -hmm. they should, you know, say it or do it. And most people are pretty understanding, you know, <laughs> so it, it's just, yeah, like those are just things to consider when you're writing an interracial couple. But of mm -hmm. course, make sure that you do it properly to whatever culture you're writing. So, yeah. yeah. But there are a lot of interracial couples out there of all kinds. So definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> surprise <laughs> surprise people <laughs> fall in love with the theme of tonight you know <laughs> okay respectfully yeah. deal with racism in a book um make sure it has purpose is the biggest mm -hmm. thing i'm gonna say like that whole thing of shock value drives me nuts do not just put in something racist because you want this big shock and you want a big reaction. Make sure that it has a place and purpose in your book. Mm -hmm. Obviously books like The Help, there is so much racism and prejudice and awful stuff in this book, but- I just got like the chills. Like you get, every time you bring that, I'm like, oh, it's a good book. Right. <laughs> it's a really good book. Yeah. But it all has purpose. It's all important to the story. And if you took it out, it's, you know what, I don't know what you'd be reading because the whole purpose of this book is talking about the lives of these black Would women. Would you say that the <laughs> racism in the book follows the rule of lamb? It definitely follows the rule of lamb. Without it, I wouldn't really know what I was reading because I'm like, the book was changed, Mississippi, right? there's going to be a lot of racism going on. Yeah. Know? So yeah. if it wasn't there, I'd be like, uh, what am I reading? Okay, so <laughs> Katrina says it is important too to not let macro and microaggressions uh, go go unaddressed. Yeah, yeah, I agree yeah. wholeheartedly with yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, where was I going with that too? I can't help you with that because I have been forgetting everything. <laughs> it's Pisces season. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Pisces. I'm an Aries, and all I know that Meg told me is I'm supposed to rest and relax this month, which, how do I do that with a puppy? Um, <laughs> I'm, like, so annoying. I'm literally in, like, a star chart. Like, <laughs> I read my horoscope ironically, okay? Like, <laughs> back to addressing racism yes, in your book, sorry. though. Um... I keep getting texts. Why do people, why are people talking to me? Um, <laughs> I'm such a terrible person. Like, stop talking to me, people. Um, oh, I keep losing my train of thought. Um, How sad would it be if somebody was literally watching the show and then they saw you react that way? Like, they text you and they were just like, <laughs> oh, I thought this was a good idea. And then it like comes up and you're like, oh God, like. <laughs> the same. Um, yeah, so addressing race in the book, yeah. So shock value, make sure it has purpose. Don't let yeah. things, yeah, and like you said, don't let micro, um, macro and microaggressions go unaddressed. And, and not only that, but learn what that means and you know watch for it because yeah. it's everywhere you know mm -hmm. so and um yeah and again i'm gonna say sensitivity readers um yeah. if Race you 
you know, if you feel unsure if you've addressed racism in your book in a in a respectful way or anything like that, don't be afraid to get someone to read it over and tell right. you. And I will also say, like, I always like to do this disclaimer with sensitivity, sensitivity readers and beta readers. Mm -hmm. Just remember that any advice anyone gives you is not meant to hurt you. It's not meant to say that you're a bad writer or anything like that. They're just trying to help you create, you know, a book that is meaningful and, you know, and, will... And not and only that, wide audience. <laughs> but, you know, just always consider, no matter how many times you've rewritten this novel, every single version of it is a draft. If mm -hmm. there is something that needs to be changed because it is wrong or because it offends people or whatever, you just go back to the draft and write it again, you know? I mean, just yesterday, Meg pointed out something in a book that I wrote. She's like, oh, she's like, you missed this point here. So this is a bit of a plot hole. And I was like, I did not oh. use those words, but thank you for making me sound smart. Anyway, the point <laughs> is, like, I, she said it to me and I know, so I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. And so mm -hmm. it's just, you go back and you rewrite it and like, it wasn't a big deal. And it's not like Meg was like, oh my gosh, you missed this. Your book sucks. <laughs> That's not what she you was saying. You should quit writing forever. <laughs> we can't do a show together. <laughs> <laughs> so never feel that way. All right. Um. Should I go see if my puppy's awake so I can introduce her? Yes, them? you should. Right. I'll be right back. Make me you, uh, you fill the uh, abyss by talking to people. Hello. Hi. Since we have a lull in the conversation, um, I will take a moment to take this book out from behind me. I love to support people who are in our community here. And this is from the author, Emma Mallory. And she wrote The Pleasure List, which was on Wattpad. It still is. Uh, but this is the physical copy of it. You can get it on Amazon. And it's just gorgeous in every way. And I love it so much. So I put it behind me tonight so that everybody could see it. But she is in our Discord community and our So You Wanna community. And she's great. <coughs> she's an awesome person. And Edgar is here! Yay! <laughs> This yeah, is like, it does. Uh, so Trina says it looks really great. It really does. Like this is such a gorgeous book. I can't, I can't even describe like how great this is. I immediately put it on my shelf. I'm so proud of it. I love it. It looks amazing. She did such a phenomenal job with it. So. Again, she is at author Emma Mallory if you like to follow her or hunt her down in our Discord and talk to her there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Well, this yes, is a spicy room. She's the newest employee of So You Wanna. Yay! He's only, he's only nine weeks old, so we might be exploiting child labor laws, but. No, my fit. This is a volunteer. Are you getting paid? I'm not getting <laughs> paid. Oh, you're not getting paid? <laughs> yeah. Wow. My favorite part of Edgar, though, is that guys look at his ears. They're so long. <laughs> and, like, Ella will call me when, like, he's, like, going out to potty and he, like, <laughs> steps on his ears and they get in the snow and I'm like you really need to like hold them back for him like don't you think she should like hold him back like it's her bestie puking at a party or something like <laughs> but they're so cute and they're long he's great they're floppy oh uh, yeah Katrina it's really good it's very spicy it's it's very very spicy. it's a great mature romance it's so good yeah. Hi. Hi. All right, guys. Okay. Well, our hour is up. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and I'm I'm, the dog. This is now a show about dogs. Yeah. Well, I I'm, I just don't want them to pee on me. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so. I have a cat, so I don't know what that means, but I'll take your word for it. Well, yes. Yeah, so, but you've had dogs, so you know what it means. <laughs> yeah, I've had dogs. But, okay, yeah, that does. I just want to point out, you guys, look at these meaty paws. Like, they're so big. <laughs> I'm going to go let them 
mixed signals here, okay? <laughs> you keep telling me every time I phone over Edgar that it's time to wrap it up, but then you put his paw <laughs> in front of me, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. Do you <laughs> want me to wrap it up, or do you want me to talk about Edgar? <laughs> Oh, man. oh my gosh, people want you to attach mops to his ears so that he's always cleaning. Oh, okay. Well, I will tell you, whenever he drinks water, his ears fall into the water bowl. And then whenever he comes out, there's just like these two streaks from his ears, like along my floor. <laughs> oh, I have, Edgar. I have all laminate floors, and this is why, because I, you know, like to buy dogs. So. <laughs> Squealed. I know. It's so cute. My other dog is now barking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's she a can lot of dogs me. here. <laughs> she can hear me. She's like, you traitor. Bob says, look at the distinguished gentleman. Yes, he's also known as Sir Edgar, so. Who calls him Sir Edgar? I call him Sir Edgar. What? When? You've never told me that. You know I love knights. How could you not tell me that? He is Sir Edgar. Oh, my God. Edgar. Okay, we should really wrap this up. He's starting to get a little bit like... I'm sorry. Okay, let me get to it. Jeez. Our hour is unfortunately up. This is not a scripted show. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who came out tonight and who listens to our podcast and who comes here every week and subscribes to our YouTube and is in the Discord and everybody who just is in the writing community we are so grateful for all of you we love seeing your books yada yada so yes yeah thank you uh next week is our february recap so that's where we will give you the highlights from this month um edgar will not be there <laughs> i just want to say that the chat says why did you name him edgar oh, and why L why? why did we name him edgar <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, I don't know. I was, so I don't know. I was just going through like a list of names and that's the one that he looked like the most. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he looks like an anchor. Like a butler. All right. <laughs> the butler on the wrist. Okay. So anyway, yep. yeah, come back. We'll be doing the February recap next week. Same time, same place. We want to see you there. Bye. <laughs>